simple question. What's most surprised you about the actual profession of being an actor? Oh, boy. James. <laughs> James. <laughs> <laughs> surprised me? You. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting profession where I remember it was around, it was like a year that I was actually doing Spider-Man. Willem Dafoe was playing my dad. Robert De Niro had just played my father in a different movie. And it was like, this is one of the only professions I think where it's like, you get to work with all your heroes and, um, and in such an intimate way. I mean, even other artistic, you know, other artistic practices, like you don't work with like your actual heroes in that kind of intimate, you know, relationship mm, yeah. in, in, in quite the same as way. As an equal, as a peer. Yeah. yeah. You can, uh, you really can great. be an assistant to Annie, Annie Leibovitz, but, yeah. you know. Yeah. 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 What surprised you, Tom? I think that it's still just as much fun as it was mm. from the first time I figured out that people took it seriously. I mean, when I was in, at whatever level you're at, when I was in high school and I found out, this is a class you can take? Are you kidding me? As opposed to drafting or sociology or accounting? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You get credit for this? Yeah. Well, first of all, that's the greatest racket I've ever heard of. But then the, the amount of fun that it was, I still feel the same excitement uh, knowing that uh, that we're going to perform this kind of like student one act play, you know, at uh, next week, as I do when I get a job now, it's still this this intense excitement of oh, we're going to get to take a whack at this thing, and they take us seriously as they do it. Each time you do something, it's always different because there's so many moving parts, what you're working on, the people you're working with, in in terms of film. Uh, the configuration is always different. One of the first things I find that you have to do is kind of sort of figure out what, what you're doing or at least know where to start from because it's different every time. It's not like you can uh, figure out a way to approach things and then use that it even as a template. It, it changes always changes. Every the target's time. always moving. That's how do you go about it. figuring it out? Um, you know, uh, I like that. I like that not knowing, uh, going to that place of not knowing, going towards something. And, and if you've done it enough times, you know, the fear that a lot of actors feel, including myself, when you start something, um, it's nice to get comfortable with fear. If you're really conscientious and you really tap into a certain kind of wonder and a certain kind of process of creating something rather than just interpreting something, once you get in that place of not knowing, you've been there before, and it kind of gives you this um, kind of uh, courage that you wouldn't normally have, that you mm -hmm. don't normally have in life. Yeah. And I think Has this fear ever overwhelmed you? Yes. Yeah. Sure. It was just before um, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, and uh, I'm not really sure what happened. Two or three weeks before we started, I... Um, F froze and had bone-crushing stage fright. Mm. And I'd never, I'd never experienced it before, and I really just sort of didn't know what, what was going on. I'm not sure what you call it. It, it was anxiety, a panic attack, or... Um, you hadn't done but, a lead in a while, right? Was that part of it? Yeah, perhaps. I'm glad to say I've worked with people in the theater who vomit and, you know, I <laughs> like every night. And they... I heard Pacino did that with American Buffalo. You just get some pea soup just so you can have something to vomit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. But you, wow. you, you know, a shaking in the wings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would sometimes look at that and I was always... Yeah, of course we all have a first preview or a first night. Mm -hmm. But I was always relatively a relaxed performer. I looked forward to going out there and wasn't that sort of person who was terrified in the, in, in, in the wings. And I would look at these people and think, oh, God, if I had to do that every night, if I mm. felt like that every night, I don't know how I would carry on. So it wasn't something that I'd had or experienced before. It was really debilitating it was it sounds was, like it's a pressure of the role like you you really like to you and, those roles were like and i i think also it was trying to slay the the the, the dragon i've since spoken with other actors ken branner who said he was on a set in a scene and it started to come upon him and he went through it 
and and I realised that I was not alone. You know, it was like you know, like an AA meeting or something. You go, yeah, I've experienced. <laughs> yes, you know, I, my, 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 my name's Colin Firth, and, and I've experienced. <laughs> how, did you, yeah. how, how did you? How did you? How did you? How did you get over that? Doctor prescribed me something, mm -hmm. just just to calm me down, to give me a ceiling. You know, uh, just just to, to sort of take take the edge. Up. And and you know what? I got to the set, walked up to the set. And went. Um, oh yeah, I know. I know. I know where I am. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. okay. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And it was. It's just it a was, high wire. And it, yeah. three thousand feet yeah. above <laughs> the <laughs> hard surface floor. It, and you it, have a bar to keep your yeah. balance. And uh, have you experienced you know, anything like that? I was competing with uh, Jason Robards in the post because he played Ben Bradley, and and so was I. It's like, as Ben Bradley, uh, I mean, he he owns that that role from all the president's men. So here we're doing it. And I was actually given permission to forget about it by Ben Bradley himself because I was looking, I watched all the video that I could have got. And he gave quite a number of interviews and Bradley, he talked about, well, you know, and then they made that movie, you know, and uh, every day someone comes up to me and says, well, you don't look like Jason Robards. <laughs> and that's, well, then you know what? It's all, you know, there's, there's been a lot of Hamlets. There's been a lot of Richard III's. I wouldn't be surprised if there were a lot of Ben Bradley's. Oh, dear, I don't like hypothetical questions. Well, I don't think you're going to like the real one either. Do you have the papers? Not yet. Oh gosh, oh gosh, because you know the, the uh, position that would put me in. You know, we have language in the prospectus. That yeah, I know, I know that which, the bankers can which... change their mind, That's, and I know what is at stake. You met him? Oh yeah, I had, I had dinner with him a number of times. What was that like? He was exactly, he was the, the most confident man on the planet Earth. Loved his job, knew uh, that he was Cracker Jack at it. And uh, Ann Roth, anybody work with Ann Roth? The, uh, yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Ann Roth, the, the costumer, she's, she's really particular about building the character along with you. And <clears throat> we were shooting it and I'm trying all these shirts that I would never wear in a million years. And she said to me, do you know why Ben Bradley walked into a room and owned it? Do you know why? And I said, because he knew. And she said, because he knew. So you end up just mm -hmm. building this kind of, you couldn't explain it, you couldn't write it down for a million years, but you take it from whatever source you can, and you think, yeah. hey, I'm safe here, I'll be, I'll be all right. Yeah. Yeah. Were you ever intimidated when you, when you work on something? Were you, are you intimidated if you work for, with Meryl Streep? I don't know. I don't <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, there, there's an intimidate. I don't. I don't think. I, I don't feel like we're really making the movie until about three days in, you know? <laughs> because you got to meet everybody yeah. and you're yeah. trying yeah. to get it. And you you yeah. probably haven't rehearsed, but you are saying, you know, I know your movies and I know you. You know, we know everybody. You're just some degree of fan. And until you get to that place where you're just in the slog of things, it's the, then you're making the same movie. But I will tell you. I don't know if you found this, but the legends, the heroes that you get to work with, they all do it the same exact way. Yeah. They want to run the lines, they want to get it down, they try it a million different ways, they start, they stop, yeah. they feel confident, they don't. And that also was a liberating process to mm. witness. I felt like that with John Hurt, um, having worked on, on Tinker and the first day of, of working with him. I couldn't wait to get there. And there he was smoking a cigarette, standing there outside his trailer. And I was absolute, I was fanboy. You know, yeah. it was like, oh my God. He happened to be a really wonderful, wonderful human being, too, as well as a, as, as well as a great actor. But it was just such a thrill to meet him and to do, and play some scenes with him. You know, I admired him. He's worked so much over you, the years. You shot a scene as dolls with Prince William and Prince Harry. Was that intimidating? <laughs> yeah, or? And, uh, and Tom Hardy. Um, it was a, a strange contrast of a, a weird family, but it wasn't intimidating. It was fun to me. I thought it was like, of course, it's, mm. it's Star Wars. They're going to bring the royal family. And <laughs> it felt, it felt were fun. They, were they in Stormtrooper costumes? <laughs> yeah, they were, they were wrapped in, in, in Stormtrooper costumes. Um, and, and so that was just for me, just, it's, it's the best, it's best of both worlds for me, you know. But it was a great experience seeing it. When you, when you make the Star Wars movies, is it hard not to go, tew, tew, 
when you're firing the things by I'm, yourself? I'm doing it all the damn yeah, time. Yeah, all the time. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. All the time. It's just one of the, it's, you're, you're a child. You're, you, there's there's a, a new planet every day and a, and a new scene to, to, to play. And it just makes you feel as if you're a part of history in a sense and, and a part of something that you, you, you grew up knowing. But now it's, it's your reality and it's just... It's, it's strange on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, that's the surprising thing again about what we do. There, you were, yeah. you know, you're watching these films as a kid, and then suddenly, you're in one. Yeah, yeah. And as, as yeah. everyone says, like I'm, you know. Literally... Is it different when you're in a real life story like Detroit? And how do you go about mm. researching that? Um, it's definitely different. It's the importance that this true story is going to be seen by so many people. And the world is tainted right now, and this story is sensitive to, to the issues that we have. And you're basically creatively commenting on something. It puts you in a position of some form of responsibility. So on set, there is much more of a, a level of seriousness. But it's, it's, it's shared in unity. But it's still, there's a much more of a, a serious tone that's required on a set like Detroit. Whereas in Star Wars, you know, you've got J.J. Abrams, you know, popping every mm -hmm. cashew you can find in his mouth. And, you know, everyone's having much more of a lighter time because it's like, oh, it's Chewbacca getting his hair just brushed. You know, it's like... What do you mean moments. the world is tainted now? I mean, it, Detroit is a reflection, even though it's set near enough 50 years ago, it's a reflection of what's going on now in terms of race relations. And it's strange, you know, you watch a movie like Detroit and expect it to be based in, you know, 2017. And the lines are blurred in terms of how far we've come. Fellas, uh -huh. you know, sometimes when a black guy is put in a position of authority, other black guys, they like to single you out, okay? Because I'm not supposed to tell them what to do. When we have these conversations, we do them in stages, okay? Stage one, witnesses. Stage two, suspects. Do you ever feel that, as actors, you're not doing something meaningful enough, or, or do you feel that there is a purpose to it? Oh, I think we, I just want to entertain and make people laugh. Sam just want to get that check. I just want to get the check. Uh, I mean, you know, it's that always Broadway Sam, check. just the Broadway yeah, well, You're making those big money choices, Sam, without a yeah. I mean, you always kind of think you're doing Citizen Kane. You know, <laughs> and nobody, see, nobody sees the movie, or sometimes people do see the movie, but I think you think you're doing Hamlet every time, and then sometimes it turns out that way, sometimes it doesn't. I think you're trying to do the best thing ever. The same commitment and energy goes into making a bad movie. No one sets exactly. out to exactly. do it. the story yeah. of my movie. <laughs> Which proves us <laughs> too. He thought he was making a streetcar named Desire. Well, and, uh, does he still think that? That's one of the crazy uh, things about Tommy Wiseau. On the original poster, he had written the copy. He wrote Tennessee Williams level drama. Shows what he, he thought he had made. He, he, he told people they would not be able to sleep for two weeks after watching a movie because they'd be so devastated. <laughs> and then when it came out, people laughed. Wow. And he didn't take Tennessee Williams level drama off the poster. He just added an enjoyable black comedy. <laughs> so it's like he went into that trying to just make a, a movie that would, you know, move people, the best movie that he could. Is that how you approach the role as well, being an actor, playing an actor? I tried to make the best movie I could. <laughs> I, I, no, but, I, but it was about how I treated him. I treated him with, as, with respect as somebody, mm -hmm. as an outsider artist just trying to do what we're all trying to do. You know, everybody that comes to Hollywood is on the outside and with a dream. It's all of us. And so if I treated it like that, it would become a much bigger story than just a spoof about a guy that made Do you it. all know what this is about? This, yeah. The film The Room, which may be the worst film ever made. Uh, I mean, there are... What, what film was this that I miss? What? The, the My Room. My movie, The Disaster the, Artist, yeah. is about is the making of an actual film called The Room. Now, not the great Brie Larson. Yes. Okay, yes. Yeah. Well, that, was, that was Room, so you, yes. you, you made it no, through the room. WGA with the addition of TFG. Yeah, a couple years ago when she won, they had to, at the screenings of The Room, they said, not the Brie Larson <laughs> one. And, uh, it came out, he paid for everything. It was $6 million of his own money. It looks about, like, it was made for $6. He put it out for two weeks to qualify for the Academy Awards. It didn't qualify. And... Then it just became a cult hit, and it's been playing for 14 years, oh. every once a month, in almost every major city. 
Wow. Yeah, it's a whole thing. Oh yeah, Tommy weird. Tommy like Frankenstein. He like, he like vampire rapist. I hear everything. I have ears everywhere. I hear your whispers in your souls. You're on my planet. Okay? Wait, wait, so you've been spying on your entire production. Yeah, that's right. That's fucking crazy. That's how it is. So now you know. Next time you make laughter, ha, 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 ha. I don't care who you are. You're out on the street. What about me? Am I still fired? All right, I'll give you one more chance. Yeah. Did he ever ask you oh. if you liked his film? I love the film. I mean, <laughs> no, I do. Like, it... I've watched that film almost as much as any, oh, the James Dean films. I've watched that film about 50 times. And so have the, have the fans. The Room gives, it's like the gift that keeps on giving. People just keep coming back. So there, you have to sort of admit there's something there, you know? And I don't think it's just that he made strange, bizarre choices all the way through. I think it's partly the magic sauce is that he, there's so much passion underneath. I mean, there are thousands upon thousands of bad movies that we'll never watch again. But people watch this one over and over. And I think it's partly because of the heart and soul underneath. You said something, you said, you know, we're, we're all, at one point of an outsiders with a dream. Were you an outsider with a dream? And what was your dream? Mine, when I started uh -huh. performing? Um, really just to make things and be near people that uh, excited me. And uh, I started out in the theater, in an unconventional theater in uh, New York, and was with that theater for 27 years. We'd go there every day and work, and uh, we'd open things in process. Once we made things, we'd keep them in repertory. And then after a while, we were pretty much reviled for many years. And then uh, we started to get some play with uh, international touring mm. and started getting a reputation. And then through Europe, we kind of were accepted here. Why were you guys reviled in, in American initially? Why? Oh, they just thought what we were doing is bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, they, they, they just didn't think. It, because they, it, the aesthetic was not a, a polished aesthetic. Mm -hmm. We were doing things that uh, a lot of us, um, I was not well-trained as an actor, but most of them came from different disciplines. But that was a time in New York, we're talking about the mid-70s, where a lot of people, you know, painters were making music, dancers were making films. It was all mixed up. Mm -hmm. And there was also kind of a, a, a subculture that wasn't careerist. They were right. just doing things for now, and that was beautiful training for me. It also, uh, yeah, just it, you have to do it for your own pleasure, and you have to do it uh, to uh, express yourself, and then hopefully there's like-minded people out there. I think the second that you start thinking too much about what people need, it becomes something else. Mm -hmm. When I was playing Jesus, I was not cowed because I somehow I understood we weren't doing Jesus for all time. We were doing our Jesus, mm -hmm. wow. you know? And I think whenever you're working, you know, on a, a historical character, a character where you have a really strong reference, it's your take on it. That's, that's all you're responsible for, which is a lot. Yeah. Did playing Jesus change any of your views of religion? Absolutely. Huh. And, and for how making things, because it was one of the most um, demanding things that I've done. But Willem, what do you do? Because like, um, you played Jesus or like the vampire in Nosferatu. Those are based on real characters, but you know, who knows how Jesus looked or behaved or whatever. So the pressure's off. But like, have you ever had a, like a real life character <laughs> where, you know, it's know like, like, yeah, like, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, that kind of pressure, you know, I mean, it's your, yeah, yeah. you well, know, it's not like if you had a certain look and they're like, you didn't played, get the look right. You I, don't look yeah. like, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, like, I made a movie about Pasolini in Italy. Yeah, right. And he's there you go. a beloved figure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I did feel that responsibility, but I thought it's just crazy enough that so many people have, you know, he's a revered figure, but it takes a couple of crazy Americans to make a movie about an Italian uh, uh, cultural hero. Mm -hmm. But we had so much support from his family and, and from people around him. I was wearing his clothes. We were shooting uh, the actual places. There mm. were so many people that were 
uh, supportive, that that really helped. They were like little yeah. touchstones. They were like little um, yeah. relics that we had yeah. and, and the support of the people. Similarly, like uh, this movie, Florida Project, that's out now. Mm -hmm. One of the most beautiful things about that is Sean Baker, the director, knows how to mix actual things with fiction. We were shooting in an operating motel. Mm -hmm. And we were there basically living with those people. And what helped more than anything you stayed else, in the thing? No. I didn't stay there at night. <laughs> okay. I didn't stay there at night, but during the day I'd go there and I didn't have a yeah, trailer. Yeah. I'd had my little room and mm -hmm. I was next to Troy and mm -hmm. I was next to so and so yeah. and so and so. I'd talk to them, they'd talk to me. Yeah. You know, those people became my people. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the lesson for me there was that always has to happen. When you approach something, you know, you have to close the difference between them and us and they become you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then you have some sort of authority and some sort of stake and you're not going to uh, be e egotistical or exploitative, you know? And that's what was so beautiful, really guided by Sean in this experience because mm -hmm. the generosity of those people opening themselves mm -hmm. up and letting us be at their place mm -hmm. to mix with them and kind of mm. tell their story yeah. was, I think, what gives the film some um, integrity. You come on this property again and you won't be leaving it, you understand? I don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what I'm talking about? You're gonna play it that way, huh? Hey, hey. All right. Give me Charlie a Coachman of Cherry Hill, New Jersey. You can't keep me That's my license. I'm gonna call your name. Into the county sheriff. Now you get the fuck out of here. Sam, is there any kind of character you would refuse to play? I mean, you play a pretty mm -hmm. bigoted guy in Three Billboards. Did yeah, you hesitate? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get all these rednecks. I, uh, Green Mile. Yeah. <laughs> I play the racist. You got, you got stained uh, right off the bat. So. <laughs> At least you don't have to wear the hideous brown teeth that go along with it. <laughs> Tom was very, I was, that was my first, one of my first studio movies, Tom was very generous. Uh, I had to spit in his face. We and he just was, had this guy come yeah. in and just, oh, this genius guy is going to come in and play this other thing. That was a great you, set. That was a Good great movie. set. It was, it was like doing set. a play. It was, it, it, was, yeah. it, was, it was a bunch of guys who loved each other. We came out of our trailers Listen. for scenes that we were not in in order to watch. What you you, you went to Hollywood like Boulevard to put your hands in the concrete. Oh, yeah. And you yeah. could have gone home. They sent you away, and you came back to well, do off-camera. You came this, back to do off-camera. That's off -camera. because Frank Darabont will shoot 16-hour days and eat every meal Yeah, but you could have gone home, and you came back. Yeah. You're, you're, very, you're very generous. <laughs> well, it's very... only three blocks away. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, talk about, some let's talk about playing those bigots. Uh, have you yeah. ever said no to one because you just well, couldn't bear the character? I I, I can't. I think the the pedophile thing is something I can't mess with. Uh, that that that's something I, it's too. I did that once, and it's that's. But the, the, I, they're always trying to throw me on a horse, or uh, you know, it's weird because I'm a city kid. I for some reason I think I have an affinity for it, and I've dated some southern girls, and and. So it's, uh, and I, I watched Coal Miner's Daughter maybe too many times, you know, <laughs> Tender Mercies, you know. Do you take I, those characters home with you or do they affect you in a negative way? I, uh, no, I don't. I, do, I, I go home and watch The Simpsons or something. I mean, you do, you do live with it in your mind, obviously. It stays with you. You're working. You're working. Yeah. It's working. Yeah, it's working, you know. But you don't. Gary's played some rednecks, you know. I've played some scary people. Yeah. When's the bail hearing? I asked the judge not to give her bail on account of her previous marijuana violations, and the judge said, sure. You fucking prick. You're not calling Officer Law a fucking prick in his own station house, Mrs. Hayes, or anywhere, actually. What's with the new attitude, Dixon? Your mama been coaching you? No. My mama doesn't do that. It's funny you were saying about people playing iconic, very famous yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, you know, Churchill is arguably the mm. greatest B Britain that ever lived, you know, to many. And they have an idea of who he is. And they've seen these pictures. Right. But do they really know who he is? Or do, are, they re are they remembering Churchill? Or are they remembering Albert Finney as Churchill? Mm -hmm. Or Robert Hardy mm -hmm. as Churchill? Yeah. I think I was somewhat contaminated by those other actors. 
in England, there are much more mixed feelings about Churchill than certainly in America. Sure. Mm. Um, and when I was growing up, there were those who admired him and there yeah. was a dissenting view. But did you come but, away but, with more mixed feelings about Churchill from your research? No, I came away with enormous admiration mm. for him. He's incomparable to any figure. Lincoln, possibly. Mm. Lincoln is the closest, I think. He's a man 50 years in politics. He wrote 50 books. The Nobel Prize for Literature painted 540 paintings, had 16 exhibitions at the Royal Academy, flip-flopped twice, commended in four wars. Um, flip-flopped politically. Yeah, certainly uh, his, 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 his mind and ingenuity uh, took us uh, through, uh, he navigated that very, very cleverly, the Second World War. I mean, there's, it's a towering achievement you know, the, just, just the, the life. How did you uncorrupt and yourself from those other performances? I went to the footage and I saw a man who was energized and had vitality. He looked like a baby. Mm. He had a cherubic face, a sort of naughty schoolboy grin with a sparkle in his eye. He was marching ahead of everyone. It was like moving through space with a fixity of purpose, you know, and energy. And he has been played as a sort of grumpy, a man born in a bad mood, mm -hmm. a grumpy, curmudgeon, drunk with a whiskey and a cigar. I, I didn't set out deliberately to, to, mm. to be different, mm. but the man that I saw in this footage was, was different to some of, some of the ways that he has been represented. Christian <laughs> Bale call you about the fat suit, that you're, you're a fat suit? Didn't he call you? He called me about the jowls mm. <laughs> because he said, man, that makeup's good. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you handle the, the four hours every day? I, I, four in, one out. That's usually yeah. about what yeah, it four is, Four in, right? one out. Was it yeah. prosthetics yeah. and a yeah, whole yeah. bunch of stuff? I had two people working on me at the same time and with great patience and humor, mm -hmm. we, we got through it. And of course, there's that exciting moment when <laughs> sounds three hours in, mm -hmm. or two hours 50, yeah. you start to see in the mirror. It was a lovely way in. And the interesting thing is, by the time I was ready and dressed, the crew arrived and the other actors, and we would rehearse. And I w came to the set as Churchill. Mm -hmm. So Joe Wright, the director, didn't see Gary for three months. Hitler will not insist on outrageous terms. He will know his own weaknesses. He will be reasonable. When will the lesson be learned? When will the lesson be learned? How many more dictators must be wooed, appeased, good God, given him mixed privileges, before we learn? You cannot reason with a tiger when your head is in its mouth. Tom, you've made documentaries about World War II. You did Saving Private Ryan. Have you thought about Churchill? Would you ever imagine playing him yourself? Oh, dear Lord, no. <laughs> that's, that's for not, uh, that'd, be, that'd be like me going playing a, you know, a Welsh coal miner or something like that. I, I don't think that's good casting. Uh, uh, no, hey, how about that? Is there anybody who would like to play that you haven't? Uh, no, I don't. I, I, I must say, I don't operate that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying there wouldn't something would come across the desk with, oh my lord, I can't. I've never even imagined this. But no, I, I think that is an inorganic uh, approach to, I think, what we do, which is very instinctive. We have to have some. What do they call it? A coup de fou? A lightning bolt has to hit you, and then suddenly it's, you can't get it out of your head. There are themes, though, however, that I would love to be able to examine. Uh, I made this one movie, Castaway, because mm -hmm. I wanted to examine the concept of four years of hopelessness in which you have none of the uh, requirements for living, which is food, 
Water, Shelter, Fire, and Company. Mm. But it took us six years in order to put together the alliance that would actually examine that the way it was. And I only had a third of it, and Bill Broyles only had a third of it, so we had two-thirds of this examined theme, and then nothing happened until Bob Zemeckis comes along and provided that other third. Uh, that's the stuff that, I, that ends up... Uh, what do you mean you only had a third of it? Well, I had that original idea. I said a, a guy, I, I was reading an article about uh, FedEx, and I realized that 747s filled with packages fly across the Pacific three times a day, and they're filled with nothing but packages. And I just thought, what happens if that goes down? You know, what's lost? Packages. Oh, except maybe, well, then, so it just, it's not a, it's not a. His third was the volleyball. Uh, I was going to also that, say. Actually, that Wilson. was. Wilson. No, that was, that was Bill Broyles. I had the search for the five elements, and I had, uh, and I had the logic of how he ended up there. Because you need, you need, what Dan, I did 127 hours, another guy isolated. Yeah. Mm. Until they figured out, oh, he has the video camera, and he can externalize the thoughts. It, D Danny was like, I don't know how to do it. And Simon Beaufoy, his writer, wouldn't write it until they figured that out. And the volleyball, that's what. That's what you need. Well, Bill, Bill had the volleyball, but he had Bill Broyles, who wrote it. He had me paint a face on it to give myself company. And Bob said, no, nah, it's got to come out of your own blood. You know, so he made it an accident out of a bloody hand. So it's like my offspring is there in order to talk That's to how it. Wilson was born. That's how Wilson was born. <laughs> <laughs> You lost a lot of weight quickly for that, because I remember in Green Mile, you were yeah, heavy, yeah, and then shocked. you had to lose it quick. Had a whole year. Not to get into all we that shot the fat. We shot the fat of half of the movie, and then we took a year off. Oh, oh you had a year. Uh, and Bob, didn't he, he made the Harrison uh, Ford Bob, Bob made yeah. What Lies Beneath yeah. with Harrison Ford and Michelle Pfeiffer with the same crew in order yeah. to keep everybody together. And you together. died. You and tortured I, yourself. And, and I went off and grew a beard, you know, as long as uh, uh, yeah, Interstate yeah. 10 and lost every pound I possibly could. Wow. I don't recommend it. It's no way to live. Better yeah. to stay trim and uh, <laughs> better to stay in that Jesus shape all year round. <laughs> Every now and again, you have to comment on the absurdity of what you do for a living. Yeah, absolutely. We have come, men, like know? in England, it always drives me nuts in England because you think, oh, we're going to go shoot this movie at, oh, Pinewood Studios yeah, and yeah. Shepperton Studios. And it has this patina of class and distinction and Alec Guinness and David Lee. And you get there, it looks like an abandoned That's gas a works. <laughs> <laughs> it's just one of the most hideous. Hideous, uncomfortable, cold, yeah. dank places on this planet. Absolutely. Those corridors Absolutely. and old sinks. Yeah, and yet you put yeah. on colorful clothes and come in and bounce around the set, and you go like, this is silly. You know? I want to come back to something you just said, which is, you know, you're drawn to certain themes. There's one thing that, that hasn't been explored in film, not for a while, which is the big issue Hollywood's dealing with, sexual harassment. Should it be? And what should you as guys be doing about this should, now? Should it be what? Explored by Hollywood as a theme? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, these are these, it's, it's horrible stuff that's going on. It's it's depressing and it's sad because obviously some of these people are very talented, and it's depressing that if they're predators, of course they have to go down. But I mean, it's it's fucking sad and depressing. Has it surprised you? What what's come out? No, no, I'm, no, 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 because look, there's a, there's a lot of reasons people do this for a living. Making a movie is, <clears throat> you, is a, a life experience that can create an awful lot of joy. You can meet the person you fall in love with. You can laugh your heads off. You can make the best friend you've ever had. You can work with, you can work with one of your heroes. That's the good stuff that can happen on a movie. The bad stuff can happen on a movie as well. There's some people that go into this business because they got off and having power. And the most times they feel the most powerful, which is why they went into the business, is when they're making, you know, when it, and I mean hitting on, and not necessarily, I mean <clears throat> completely sexual on somebody that's underneath them. I mean, there are predators absolutely everywhere, and I, there's some that I must say, really, wow. But there's, I mean, I mean the the big Magilla, the one that started it all off on, it says, well, you know, Harvey, you mm, mean? Yeah. Have you seen anything like that happen, and have you taken action, or have you then regretted not taking action? We produced a, a, a project in which someone said, I, there, there is a, there's an element of harassment that's going on here. And as soon as we heard, you got to jump right can. in. Mm -hmm. You got to take up, you talk to every one of the guilds and find out what happens and you go immediately there. There's stuff that happens on a set that can be really inappropriate. 
And there can be that type of predatory aspect on a set because you think, well, we're in the circus and we're on the road. So therefore, the rule, do the rules really apply? They don't yeah. really apply. There's the other aspect of it is, is that <clears throat> come try to get this job from me. You want, you want me to give you a job? Come on, come. Come prove to me that you want this job. That's a sin, and that's against the law, and that is a degree of harassment and predatory behavior that goes against an assumed code of ethics. I think eventually, I think everybody who has an office uh, or a production office above the coffee maker or the copy machine is going to have a code of ethics and behavior. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. don't follow these, you will not work here. And that's not necessarily going to be a bad thing. Somebody said, I don't know who, who it was, it says, is it, why? Is it too late to change things? No, it's never too late to change things. It's never too late to learn, to learn new behaviors. And that's a responsibility of anybody who... Uh, um, who uh, think, uh, wants to obey that, uh, a code of professional ethics. Mm. You will agree with that, James? Yeah, the cha if it changes, it, yeah, of course, of course. Any situation where, you know, one group of people is, you know, being taken advantage of or treated differently than, you know, needs to change. It's everyone's responsibility to step up, of course. What's been your own toughest moment as an actor when you were talking about, you know, that fear or something else? Have you had a particularly tough moment? Mm. On the circle. Talking about fear again? Oh, really? Yeah. 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 What happened what in happened? the circle? Uh, on my second to last day, um, I had a, a big speech oh, yeah. that basically put the whole movie and the narrative in context for the audience who were listening for the last two hours. Um, and it was a really important moment. And I just, I, I just froze up. I, f I froze up and I, f I forgot the whole thing. Um, and I was there on set with Emma Watson, who was amazing about it. I literally found myself in a, basically a, a 01 acting class with Emma Watson trying to say, just remember, just remember the lines. What are your intentions? What are your motivations? And I just couldn't, I couldn't get it. And it was embarrassing. It? How'd you get through it? Well, they had to, um, they, cards or... I mean, they had to shoot it chunk by chunk. But at the same yeah. time, you know, I had, you know, Emma Watson behind, you know, just trying to mouth the lines. I just, mm -hmm. I just couldn't, I couldn't, I, I didn't understand it, and I, and I had to reevaluate this whole thing when I when I got uh -huh. back into my private time and understand what the issue was. And, and what was the issue? The issue was fear of schedule. I have a fear. Oh, yeah, I have yeah. a fear of schedule. I've I've only just started my my career, and this is my first year in which I've worked on projects back to back. I've never had that opportunity in my career before. So, one of the things that I picked up was that I'm now viewing my life in chunks. Oh, I'm filming. Star Wars in 2017, then I've got another thing to do. It's adorable 2020. When the kids experience. So it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's mad that I've never experienced it before because, you know, where I grew up and how I grew up is a, it's a day by day situation. It's, um, you know, it's, it's class every day. You know, it, it's, it's, it's church on a particular day. Mm -hmm. But now it's like, well, you've got this schedule that's six, seven months down the line and you're now viewing your life in chunks. And sometimes you forget to, to rest. Your mind is. is where you constantly th sorry, going. I mean, is it a thing where you feel like you have to be responsible for an, you, you know, for an entire year, you're gonna have to be yeah, a certain it, amount of- it's that, so you overwork. I mean, you, you, know, you know that you've got time to prepare yeah. for the role, but I guess, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a young man, I try to just do the testosterone thing and just juggle <laughs> and have it all going <laughs> yeah, at the same yeah, time, yeah, trying yeah, to sure. learn yeah. lines for this, <laughs> trying to be prepped for that, training for that. And then I understood yeah. my limits, you know. James, you do a little juggling, right? Not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you, you said you I stopped. stopped. Um, you said recently you, you hit a wall. I did. When you juggle long well. enough, you, you drop some balls. I mean, not drop balls, but <laughs> yeah, it's just, yeah. not, and it's not actually like that. It's more like, um, it's okay, you can I, drop some balls when you get okay. some money in the air, man. Whatever the metaphor. You know, it's more like, uh, I was doing that, I was holding on to work because it was where I felt the most safe. And it, and it was just like, not even not even being aware of that, it was just like, I, I need more, I need to fill this, I need to fill this. Subconsciously, it was just like, that's what I know the best and that's where I feel most comfortable. And then realizing after a while, it's sort of diminishing returns that, you know, doing so many things for me was actually not comforting me anymore. And that if I realized 
be more, you know, fewer things with more attention with people that, you know, I really love working with and care about, that that will give me exactly what I was, you know, seeking by doing so many things. I had a little, just under a year to, to think about Churchill and we had four weeks rehearsal in a rehearsal room with props, mm -hmm. with furniture, saying the words out loud with the actors that you're gonna be doing the scene that's, with. That's awesome. Discussing, yeah. Yeah. you know, what works, what doesn't work. I have to say, you know, I go in and out of, I lose my love for it. I lose my love for acting because it, it's, you get there, you're supposed to have a relationship with a person that you've only met the day before. You don't really rehearse. Mm. You kind of block with camera sometimes out of the gate. And you go, you wanna go, you wanna do one? Yeah, you do a take. Yeah, that was good, that was good. You want one more? Well, I've come all this way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's, you know, and we've got to, we've, we've, we've got to move on. It's amazing, anything is any good. Uh -huh. And uh, I just yeah. get so sad working like that and go, really? You, you know. Did you I ever think of quitting acting? Many times. Oh. So then where do you find the passion for it again? Or, when you, or do get, you, when you do something that comes as, as, uh, as Mr. Hanks here said, you know, it's not, I mean, it was, you know, Dracula was never on my bucket list. Mm. It was Coppola, which made it interesting and it came across the desk. So you're at the mercy of the industry, the imagination of the people that are casting you, and they go, oh, yeah, Gary's played these villains. What about Jim Gordon? You know, and then a, a, a Tinker Taylor comes in, or a Churchill, or an opportunity to work with, as I've done with, uh, sadly, the late Tony Scott mm. that I work with, and I work with Ridley, and you work with some of these people, and it, it, you get re-energised and inspired, and you, you, get and you remember asked? why you, you, you want to do it. Let me, let me ask yeah. you. I was, Gary, I, I mean, that sounds like a month of rehearsal sounds amazing and yeah, it's sounds almost good. unheard of. Mm. You know, yeah. I'm sure you and Joe Wright like led the charge on that. Like, this is what you want to be a yeah. part of this movie. This is what we're doing and all yeah. that. But, you know, a lot of times you just can't do that. But I also think like sometimes it depends on the type of film. Like, yeah. 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 <clears throat> for example, like, I don't know, maybe you guys had a month of rehearsal for the Florida Hodges. I don't know. But like, I remember doing another Florida movie, Spring Breakers, and part of the vibe of that is immersing into the environment mm -hmm. and bringing, you know, sure. uh, the real people in. And so I don't, I really don't think a month of rehearsal with like non-actors is going to help. But, that, but that, that was the Harmonies film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Which you were yeah. superb. Um, I heard you but, watched it and you didn't know it was me. I, d I had no idea it was you. <laughs> and, right. Yeah, that's an incredible. And, uh, thing. I said, that, "God, that creepy ass guy. Where'd you find him?" And they went, "This one's Franco." Um, I haven't seen it. It's really a phenomenal film. Yeah, um, but, did, but did, did, your, your scenes with the king, for example, with that must have the rehearsal for those scenes must have played huge dividends because every beat is so tiny yeah, yeah. and small, mm -hmm. and you can't find that in you know before lunch on the set and then move yeah, on to the second we, half of the scene. Yeah, we came in and the rhythm and we clicked and, uh, and just really started to roll mm. from, from, from take one. I, 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 that what you're talking about, and I would, hey, I, would I've, I know Harmony and we've often talked about doing something together and I would gladly throw myself into something like that. That, that, that is a, a very specific kind of movie that you're talking about and an experience that you're talking about mm -hmm. with, a, with a director that has a real point of view and a process that, that he, mm -hmm. with the way he likes to work. I'm just talking about yeah. some of those, you. where you feel like it's just, you're, you, you've got to work, mm. but you don't want a job. You, 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 that's that, it's, it's that. Is there a film that you've seen recently that has revitalized you or this actually changed your thinking about something from this year? I'm gonna say get out. Mm. Yeah, that was damn good. Get out, get out. Yeah. 
was 19 things all at once. It was a creepy Twilight Zone movie. It was a stand-up comedy act. It was about two people in love regardless of uh, their station in life. I think it's very hard to make a contemporary movie that actually does capture the zeitgeist in the place that we are in right now. At the end of the day, at the end of that movie, it accomplished something that I had never, ever, ever, ever seen in a movie. There is a dead white woman who has killed herself, right? She, he did, and there's a black guy with all her, her blood on her, and the police come, and he's innocent, but what is going to happen to this guy? And they get out of it, no spoiler well, You know alert. they reshot the ending. Yeah. Well, they right. did? Which oh, yeah. was, yeah, what which was, was the, the original he went, to he went to jail. Mm -hmm. Oh, he gets taken to jail. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, have you seen anything recently that's really impacted you? When We Were Kings had a, a big effect on me. I think that uh, there's something about Muhammad Ali, and we're talking about fear and joy. You know, Foreman made him wait 10 minutes before he came out. He was trying to psych him out. And Ali psychs himself up to get, he starts shadow boxing, talking to the audience, Ali, mm -hmm. Mumbai. Mm -hmm. And um, he, Ali's scared, you know, he's scared. That guy was, Foreman was the Mike Tyson of that time. And he, he mustered up the courage, you know. And so when I'm scared and I have stage fright and all that stuff, I think of that. Mm -hmm. Were you scared excited. when you went into three billboards? Always, always scared, yeah, sure. Of what? Of sucking, of... Uh, <laughs> You know, of all that stuff, you know, you're scared all the time. I mean, I was scared when I was doing the play Fool for Love that I would rope shitty when Ed Harris came because he'd done the original production. <laughs> yeah. And thank God I wrote good when he came, yeah. You wrote good when I came, so. Good, good. <laughs> did, did you talk about that with Martin McDonald when you did, the, did it, or what were those conversations? I think that I had the luxury of a lot of time. I went down to Southern Missouri and I did some ride-alongs with cops and stuff like that. And, huh. uh, you know. But That's interesting. That, Was that yeah. <laughs> a it, good or bad they, experience? How they treat you as yeah. a celebrity ride-along? Mm -hmm. They were great. A guy named Josh McCullen, he taped my lines in a tape recorder. My dialect coach, Liz Himmelstein, found uh, a cop. And Martin didn't want much of an accent, so I said, you know, Liz, I think we're going to have to tape another cop. This cop doesn't have enough of an accent. We found another cop. Went down and did some ride-alongs. But I have an acting coach, Terry Knickerbocker. You know, it takes a village, you know. I mean, I mm. do a lot, of, a lot of work ahead of time. You don't get to rehearse, and so you're just ready to go when you get on set. Do you all do a lot of work ahead of time? Mm. It depends. Yeah. yeah, it depends. Yeah. But you have, I think you, you have don't to. have to. You you sometimes you don't have to, I think. Yeah. When? Uh, you know, I think, for me anyway, uh, you just look for the triggers and you look for the thing that gives you the confidence to say, I am this guy, or you can receive what's happening. We were talking about different kinds of movies. I tend to make a lot of movies where you try to capture these moments and you don't get time to craft things, you know? And that's interesting. But to start out with, to overcome this fear, overcome this uncertainty, kind of direct your energies, you need to hang on to something. And sometimes it can be something as simple as a costume. Mm -hmm. I you always go back mm -hmm. to Wild at Heart. I had these teeth. They were everything. I put those teeth in my mouth mm -hmm. and it, it kept me from closing my mouth. Mm -hmm. I, I, I always had this expression and I felt like I knew who the guy was, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Other times, you feel totally um, insecure about approaching being this person until you create a history, until you make things happen, until you learn things that make you have a shift in your head mm -hmm. to feed the imagination. Because you can't just imagine things from a dead, dead you know, stop. You've got to make something, you know, and then yeah. you turn it into that's how, something. I, that's how I felt working on Detroit because it, it was interesting that the a det a detachment to, to, to the project and, and, and not enough time was a part of the creative process, especially for, for Catherine, that we, we didn't know everything that was going to happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was, a, there's, there was always a, a, a feeling of channeling that, that very, you know, nervous energy, that, that, that feeling of being fearful. She fosters that. Yeah, she, she fosters that into that. the scene. Yeah. Yeah. And so then you, you realise after about two weeks of getting used to it, that, that it's, it, it's vital. It's a, it's a part of, of, of performance for this specific project. Yeah. Whereas when I go on something else, you know, I, I, you know I, might, I might get time and I'll use it, you know. With, with Lars von Trier, he always says, he, first of all, he doesn't want you to know where the camera is. He prohibits yeah. rehearsal. And huh. his mantra is, we only need one. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know? Mm. But 
you know, then you watch something like what Gary did, it's a different kind of movie. If you could put one movie, one performance, not your own, in a time capsule, I know you're going to say several, but choose one that's particularly meaningful for you that you've seen that's impacted you. Deer, Deer Hunter. Hunter. Deer Hunter. Yeah. Why? I had a huge impact on me, I think, when I was a kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Saw it with my father. And my father kind of looked like De Niro in that. He had a beard and a mole and stuff, yeah. John? Tom Hardy in The Warrior was, to me, just a, a powerful performance. Personally, I, I found myself in, engrossed in a narrative that made me reflect into my own life just because of the versatility of roles that Tom Hardy has had back to back is, is shocking to me. Tom, what about you? Well, I'd go to Robert Duvall on any number of the characters <laughs> that he's done yeah. just because he did not look like the movie star that was supposed to be. And he did some very subtle stuff with Coppola. When I go back and examine the, the breadth of everything that he did, mm. he, I, I think a lot of what we have to figure out as actors is one is particular to us and the other one is particular to the movie. Particular to us is the behavior. We have to get the behavior down and that it's not our behavior. Uh, and matter of fact, if it is your behavior, you better go outside yourself and find something so that it's not, you're not just being you. Although sometimes it doesn't matter so much, but you have to get the behavior down. And the other part of it is the protocol, meaning like how the people live in the world that they live in, what is required of them, what is their job, uh, yeah, how much they sleep and eat. And Robert Duvall, I think he always, he always finds that behavior in the protocol. I think the best of them all is Tom Hagen in The Godfather. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not the Italian. Mm. He's the, not, even, not yeah. even related to him. He's just a kid that they found in the street, but he becomes this guy who is always explaining the legal aspect of it. If we're taking more than one, I'll say De Niro in Mean Streets, Taxi Driver, and Raging Bull. Just the prime, you know, collaborations with Scorsese and, and you know, Goodfellas, but those three, like, I've never seen De Niro behave in the way that he did in Mean Streets. It's just like yeah. this this exuberance of youth. He's just like yeah. ready to go. And it's like the first collaboration with with this guy that, you know, you know they'll go on to have all these incredible, you know, the incredible things together. Mm -hmm. And then Taxi Driver, there's just never been anything like that. The kind of preparation we're talking about, you know, uh, that's like Raging Bull is, that's, that's the role everyone talks, you know, gaining the weight and the whatever, like that's the role where you're like, oh, that's what preparation means. <laughs> Willem, name mm -hmm. one. Um, Frankenstein movies. Oh. Mm -hmm. Boris Karloff. Wow, mm -hmm. wow. Truly a yeah, staggering wow, yeah. performance. Wow, yeah. 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 How about you, Gary? Uh, George C. Scott. He's working in the Kubrick film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And very last Hilarious. question, speed yeah. round here. Just mm -hmm. a very brief answer. <laughs> if you couldn't act, you all have hobbies. Uh, <laughs> what would you pursue? Tom, I know you've been writing. Yeah, okay, I'll, do, I'll go with that. <laughs> Some <laughs> brand of daily journalism. Oh, mm, yeah, journalism. like a column. Goings on about town kind of thing. Oh, I'd like that. Interesting. Yeah. Well, we're very happy to hire you with the Hollywood Reporter. Know, right? I think no. you're... Easy now. But John, how about you? Probably architecture. Mm. Yeah. James? If I couldn't, if I wasn't an actor, director? Yeah. Oh, well, close. what? I mean, a writer? Well, you're probably going to get both anyway, do you know what I mean? Uh, what about you? Uh, pumping gas. I got no plan B. I don't have any skills, <laughs> man. No plan B? Yeah, that's Jeez. it. Barback and busting tables. Cook or a farmer? Oh. What mm. about yoga? You're good at A yoga. yogi? <laughs> yeah. That's my Gary. practice. Last but not least. Well, I have my sort of hobby is uh, I do 19th century uh, wet plate photography. Wow. Wow. So uh, I would do that. Um, you know, I could do that till the end of time. Wow. Mm. wow. I, 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 envy, I envy you that uh, yeah, passion. Yeah. Perfect. Well, this was such a great round table. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you. That was it. But you guys were so excellent. Like, boy, boy, boy. Ready? Okay, quiet on set. Mm. And I okay. look down the lens. Yeah. Let's do it. Hi, I'm Margot Robbie. Brian Cranston. Robert Pattinson. John Boyega. I'm Sam Rockwell. Willem Dafoe. Emma Stone. Alison Janney. Guillermo del Toro. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Thanks for watching The Hollywood Reporter. The Hollywood Reporter. The Hollywood Reporter. On YouTube. On YouTube.